The sinking of the heavy cruiser Indianapolis to a Japanese submarine would become one of the most harrowing events of World War II. Struck by torpedoes from the submarine shortly after completing a top-secret mission, the Indianapolis sank within a mere 12 minutes, taking around 300 crewmen down with it. The remaining men, adrift in the shark-infested waters of the Pacific Ocean, would face a dire struggle for survival. The USS Indianapolis, a Portland-class heavy cruiser of the United States Navy, was launched on November 7, 1931, in Camden, New Jersey. Stretching 186 meters in length and displacing nearly 10,000 tons, it was heavily armed, boasting nine 8-inch guns and eight 5-inch anti-aircraft guns. The USS Indianapolis served a dual role throughout the 1930s, operating in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and functioning in various capacities, including as a ship of state, hosting President Franklin D. Roosevelt on three different voyages. Its significance grew with the onset of World War II, where it operated in the Pacific Theater with carrier task forces. In 1942, the USS Indianapolis was deployed to the Alaska area, where it played a pivotal role in supporting U.S. military efforts in the Aleutian Islands campaign. During its service, it sank a Japanese transport ship in February 1943 and the Japanese munitions ship Akagane Maru, significantly impacting Japan's resupplying capacities, contributing to their eventual withdrawals from the Attu and Kiska Islands. Later that year, it was made the flagship of the U.S. 5th Fleet under Vice Admiral Raymond Spruance, a position it maintained into mid-1944. In the numerous island-hopping campaigns, the USS Indianapolis provided crucial support, bombarding enemy-held islands and engaging in direct combat. During this period, the USS Indianapolis took part in multiple operations, including the invasions of the Gilberts, Marshalls, Marianas, and Peleliu in September 1944. The battles of Tarawa, Kwajalein, Guam, and others saw the ship operate under the constant threat of enemy fire. In early 1945, the Indianapolis, continuing as the 5th Fleet's flagship, took part in assaults on Iwo Jima, the Japanese home islands, and the Ryukyus. During the Battle of Okinawa on March 31, 1945, the USS Indianapolis was nearly sank when it was damaged by a kamikaze attack. Prior to this, the ship had spent seven days pouring 8-inch shells into the island's beach defenses. In the same battle, the ship shot down six enemy aircraft, though she was unable to stop the attack on herself. After the kamikaze attack, a bomb caused significant damage, penetrating the deck and exploding beneath the ship, creating two large holes in the keel and resulting in several flooded compartments. Despite the severe damage, which included damaged propeller shafts, ruptured fuel tanks, and ruined water distilling equipment, the Indianapolis was able to make it to a salvage ship for emergency repairs before heading under its own power to the Mare Island Naval Shipyard. Although the ship survived the attack, it would mark an unfortunate turning point in its fate. The engineering issues of another ship, the USS Pensacola, ultimately determined the Indianapolis's next assignment. Rather than remaining at Mare Island until the end of the war, as would have been the case had it not been for the kamikaze attack, Indianapolis received orders for a top-secret mission to carry enriched uranium and other components necessary for the construction of Little Boy, the first nuclear weapon to be used in war. The ship's crew was unaware of the true nature of this mission. Pensacola was originally slated to transport atomic bomb components to Tinian, but her mechanical problems led to the Indianapolis being chosen for this task. Consequently, after rapid repairs, the Indianapolis left Mare Island earlier than expected, heading for Hunters Point Naval Shipyard in San Francisco in late July 1945. Within hours of the Trinity test, Indianapolis departed San Francisco, setting a record for the fastest transit to Pearl Harbor before moving on alone. The distance from San Francisco to Tinian Island would be covered in just 10 days. After delivering the components on July 26, the ship proceeded to Guam and then to Lake Gulf in the Philippines for further operations as part of Task Force 95. The ship would never reach the Philippines. In the late hours of July 29, 1945, and into the early morning of July 30th, the Indianapolis was nearing the midpoint of its journey. Earlier in the day, at around 1300 hours, the landing ship Tank 779, en route to Samar in the Philippines, encountered the Indianapolis, which was traveling in a zigzag pattern at about 15 knots. This brief encounter marked the last time the Indianapolis was seen by an American vessel. Just after midnight, the Japanese submarine I-58, captained by Commander Mochitsura Hashimoto, who mistakenly believed he had spotted the New Mexico-class battleship Idaho, detected the Indianapolis. 
Hashimoto ordered the preparation of six Type 95 torpedoes with Type 2 Mod 1 warheads. The first torpedo struck the Indianapolis directly in front of the forward gun mount, causing a massive explosion, followed by another that hit the middle of the ship. These attacks inflicted catastrophic damage, ripping off the ship's bow and tearing through crew berthing areas, severing her communications. The Indianapolis, which had additional armaments and gun-firing directors added as the war progressed, was incredibly top-heavy and began to list, or tilt to one side, severely. Within a mere 12 minutes, she rolled over, her stern rising into the air, and then sank. Around 300 crewmen were trapped inside and went down with the ship. The remaining 8 to 900 men were cast into shark-infested waters, with many suffering from injuries, burns, or drowning. Limited lifeboats and life jackets, along with the oil slick from the sinking vessel, only made the situation worse. Meanwhile, I-58 swiftly left the area. In the aftermath of the sinking, the surviving crew members were cast into the Pacific Ocean, hundreds of miles from land, left to endure the harsh elements and threats lurking below. With only life jackets, a few rafts, floater nets, and debris from the wreck for support, the survivors formed small groups scattered across the ocean. Their situation was dire, they suffered from exposure to the scorching sun, freezing night temperatures, dehydration, and the physical and psychological toll of their circumstance. Some managed to salvage small amounts of nourishment like crackers and spam from the wreckage, but for most, food and drinkable water were scarce or unobtainable. The ever-present danger of shark attacks only added to their suffering. Initially, the sharks fed on the bodies of those killed in the explosions, but they soon turned their attention to the living. The physical hardships were accompanied by psychological torment. Many sailors had hallucinations, being driven to madness by dehydration and saltwater poisoning. These delusions led some to believe they were swimming towards imaginary islands or diving back into the sunken Indianapolis for relief. This often resulted in ingestion of saltwater and a painful death. Others, in their confusion and despair, turned on their shipmates, mistaking them for the enemy. Despite the overwhelming adversity, there were acts of bravery and sacrifice. Crew members supported each other as best as they could, with some paying the ultimate price to keep their comrades together. The ship's Marine Detachment Commander, for example, met his end by swimming in circles around his group to maintain their unity. Additionally, the ship's chaplain passed away due to exhaustion after spending days administering last rites to his dying shipmates. The sinking of the USS Indianapolis culminated in a delayed but frantic rescue operation. Unbeknownst to Navy command, the ship failed to arrive in Late Gulf as scheduled on July 31st, and due to a series of communication errors, including ignored distress signals, the ship was not immediately reported as missing. It wasn't until four days after the sinking, on August 2nd, that the survivors were accidentally discovered. Lieutenant Wilbur C. Gwynn, piloting a PV-1 Ventura bomber on routine anti-submarine patrol, spotted the men adrift from 3,000 feet up. He immediately radioed his base and dropped a life raft and radio transmitter, beginning the rescue operations. A PBY seaplane piloted by Lieutenant R. Adrian Marks was dispatched to assist, and en route, it alerted the USS Cecil J. Doyle of the emergency. Marks, against orders, landed his plane in 12-foot swells to rescue survivors, eventually saving 56 men despite the plane becoming unflyable. Cecil J. Doyle was the first of seven rescue ships to arrive. Over the course of the night and the following morning, the rescue effort intensified with multiple ships, including USS Aylwin III, USS Bassett, and others joining in to recover the survivors. Some of the rescue crews even had to fire at sharks to recover bodies for identification and proper burial at sea. From August 3rd to August 7th, recovery operations continued, pushing wreckage and bodies west and southwest. On August 8th, USS French and USS Cecil J. Doyle concluded their search and headed for Peleliu, while Guam began receiving the survivors. By the time the rescue operation concluded, only 316 of the nearly 900 men who went in the water survived. The U.S. government delayed reporting the tragedy until over two weeks later, on the same day Japan surrendered. The sinking of the Indianapolis and the subsequent delay in rescue efforts were compounded by a series of assumptions, misinterpretations, and failures in communication within the Navy command structure. The series of events began with the procedures in place at the time for tracking naval vessel movements. 
At the headquarters of Commander Marianas on Guam and Commander Philippine Sea Frontier on Leyte, Operations plotting boards were used to track vessel positions. For large ships like the Indianapolis, it was assumed they would arrive on time unless reported otherwise. As a result, their positions were plotted based on these assumptions and predictions, not reports. When the Indianapolis failed to arrive in late on July 31st, Lieutenant Stewart B. Gibson, responsible for tracking her movements, knew of this failure but did not investigate or report it promptly. This oversight led to Gibson receiving a letter of reprimand, along with his superiors and others involved. Adding to the confusion were unclear directives and personnel lacking naval knowledge. A key factor was Pacific Fleet Directive 10CL45, which implied that the arrival of Navy combatant vessels need not be reported, leading to the dangerous assumption that non-arrivals also don't need to be reported. This misinterpretation, coupled with the rapid wartime expansion of the U.S. Navy, placed men in critical positions without a thorough understanding of naval protocols. Another issue was whether the Indianapolis was even able to send a distress signal after being torpedoed. The attack had damaged the interior communication room and electrical systems, making it unlikely that the SOS keyed by radioman Joseph Moran and others was successfully transmitted. This conclusion was reached despite later claims that distress messages had been received, but no contemporary evidence supporting this was found. The Navy's official statement initially suggested that distress signals might have been keyed but not received. Declassified records later revealed that three stations did receive signals but failed to act. As one commander was drunk, another had ordered that he not be disturbed, and a third suspected it to be a Japanese trap. The Indianapolis's secret mission delivering atomic bomb components has also been suggested as potentially contributing to the sinking and delay. Despite these claims, her mission was completed before she was sunk. The ship was not carrying the bomb parts at the time of the attack, and neither her crew nor the crew of the Japanese submarine knew of her earlier cargo until after the Hiroshima bombing. The sinking of the Indianapolis was a culmination of a number of different factors. Unclear directives, poor communication, untested equipment, inadequate life-saving gear, and overall complacency. The Navy, however, would learn from the disaster, leading to the creation of the Movement Report System to prevent similar occurrences in the future. While sharks are often emphasized in the sinking of the USS Indianapolis, with many claiming this to be the deadliest shark attack in history, the majority of the men who ended up in the water died primarily due to wounds from the torpedo explosions, drowning linked to severe dehydration, and other effects of their injuries. The role of sharks in the sinking, while significant, is often overstated. Reports from the rescue crews, including those from Lieutenant Adrian Marks and the crew of the USS Helm, highlight the presence of sharks. Marks reported seeing sharks among the survivors and feeding on remains, and the crew of the Helm had to use rifles to fend off the sharks while recovering bodies. It's true that shark attacks made up a number of the deaths, but historical accounts suggest that they more commonly fed on those who were already dead rather than attacking survivors. Captain Charles B. McVeigh III, the commanding officer of the Indianapolis, only faced more issues following the sinking of his ship. Surviving the ordeal at sea, he was later court-martialed in November 1945, becoming the only U.S. Navy captain in World War II to be tried in connection with the loss of a ship in combat. McVeigh was charged with failing to order his men to abandon ship and putting the ship at risk by not zigzagging to evade enemy submarines. He was acquitted of the former but found guilty of the latter, despite the controversial nature of the trial. One notable part of the trial was the testimony of Commander Mochitsura Hashimoto of the attacking Japanese submarine, who stated that zigzagging would not have saved the ship. This, along with the fact that McVeigh was not informed of the presence of enemy submarines in the area, raised significant questions about the fairness of the trial. Further controversy arose from the prior discussed revelations that distress signals from the USS Indianapolis were received but not acted upon. Despite being found guilty, McVeigh's sentence was remitted by Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, and he was restored to active duty. He later retired in 1949 as a rear admiral. However, the sinking and its circumstances haunted McVeigh for the rest of his life. He received hate mail from the families of deceased crewmen and struggled with the weight of the disaster. This emotional turmoil, exacerbated by the eventual loss of his wife to cancer, led McVeigh to take his own life at the age of 70 in 1968. 
And tragically, he was found clutching a toy sailor, a gift from his father given to him as a child for luck. After a mention of the sinking of the Indianapolis in the film Jaws, the ship was once again brought back into the public eye decades later in 1996, thanks to the efforts of a sixth grade student, Hunter Scott, who researched the sinking for a class history project. His work garnered national attention and played a pivotal role in the exoneration efforts for Captain McVeigh. Scott's project led to interviews with nearly 150 survivors and a review of 800 documents. This renewed interest attracted the attention of retired congressional lobbyist Michael Monroney, who had a personal connection to the Indianapolis, and Captain William J. Toady, the final commanding officer of the submarine USS Indianapolis. Toady's analysis supported the claim that zigzagging would not have prevented the attack by the Japanese submarine. These efforts culminated in a hearing by the Senate Armed Services Committee in September 1999, where survivors testified, swaying Senator John Warner to allow a sense of Congress resolution. In October 2000, Congress passed this resolution, which President Bill Clinton signed, officially stating that McVeigh should be exonerated for the loss of the Indianapolis. This exoneration came too late for McVeigh, but served to correct the record and provide some closure. In July 2001, Secretary of the Navy Gordon England directed Captain Toady to enter this language into McVeigh's official Navy service record, clearing him of all wrongdoing. The survivors of the Indianapolis, along with McVeigh's sons and other advocates, had long contended that McVeigh was unfairly convicted. It was revealed that McVeigh had requested, but was denied a protective escort, and that the Navy had known about Japanese submarines in the area, but didn't warn him. McVeigh's death ultimately motivated the survivors and others to seek justice for him. These efforts spanned decades and involved significant lobbying, including appeals directly to Congress. Ultimately, it was a letter from Hashimoto to Senator Warner that helped shift the sentiment towards exoneration, in which he wrote, Our peoples have forgiven each other for that terrible war. Perhaps it is time your peoples forgave Captain McVeigh for the humiliation of his unjust conviction. In a symbol of reconciliation, Hashimoto's daughter and granddaughter attended a 60th anniversary event for the Indianapolis. This gesture, along with the exoneration, represented the closure of a painful chapter in U.S. naval history.